All right, let's take a look at the inner axle differential. Uh, looking at the cutaway that we have here in the shop, we'll be able to see how the inner axle itself relates to the front differential as it's all mounted in that carrier housing. So if we sort of take a, an overview look here, what we'll see is that our input comes from our driveline into the input yoke that is bolted and splined. So it's splined primarily for the path of power and bolted to hold it in place to the input shaft and the input shaft goes through into our differential case. And so if we turn this to get this to the top, we'll see a small circle here. That's the differential cross shaft. So we go from our input yoke through input shaft to differential cross shaft, remembering that the inside of that cross shaft is splined. Then we'll drive through the differential pinion gears to the side gear profile, remembering that the side gear profile is actually cut into this helical drive gear. So from the helical drive gear then goes down to the helical driven gear, which is mated or one, it's the same piece as our pinion shaft. So it would be splined to our pinion shaft and we would drive into from the pinion to the bevel gear and then from the bevel gear in to our differential case that we can see right here. So we can see the cutaway of the differential case and we see the side gear going to the axle shaft from inside the case. So that'd be our path of power here. So if we take a look at how it operates and some of the speeds, one of the things we talked about in class was that all of our speed will go to the path of least resistance. And so what we want to see is first off that as I rotate the input yoke, we see the cross shaft move. There is no change there. Even if I hold the helical drive gear, which would be splined through the helical teeth to the pinion on the front, I can rotate the input and have those differential pinion gears go around the side gear profile on the helical drive without moving or having this cross shaft change from my input shaft. So what I'm trying to say is the input shaft is splined to the differential cross shaft no matter what. So we can see right here there's a collar and this collar that's mounted on there is for the ability to lock the inner axle differential. So if we had the dog teeth lined up, we'd be able to slide that into engagement and now my input speed will be mechanically locked to the helical drive gear. And so what we've done with that locking collar, because the collar is splined to the input shaft, we're essentially locking the input shaft, the differential cross shaft, and the helical drive gear all together so they're mechanically rotating as one giant mass. And when we don't allow independent rotation of the differential spider gears because it's locked like this, we also lock the rear output shaft that we can see right here. So we can see that rear output shaft right there. And when we come on the input side, if I rotate, all of it rotates as a giant mass, all of it. The input yoke, my differential drive gear, my cross shaft, my differential case, the locking collar, and the output side to, it'd be the side gear to the output shaft that goes to the rear axle. And so what we'll see splined into this output right here is the output shaft. And the splines on the end of this output shaft become the yoke then to the rear drive axle. So if I line up the white mark that's on the top here, what I want to show us, so there's going to be a white mark right there and I'm going to change to the other profile. I'm going to unlock the inner axle differential. And what I want to show is that if I turn in just a half a turn on the input yoke, what we're going to see is one complete revolution on the output shaft so long as I hold or don't allow the helical front or the helical drive gear for the front pinion to rotate. And so what that'll simulate really is that my front axle has good traction. The tires have good traction to the ground and the rear drive axle is sitting on ice and is able to spin. So we're going to simulate a rear axle spin condition by holding this helical drive gear stationary. So I'm going to input on my front yoke that would come off my transmission, my drive line would come into here. And I'm going to rotate that one half a turn and we're going to see that on the output side it's going to rotate one complete revolution. So I'll change to the front view here. 
and you'll see, or to the rear view, and you're gonna see that output revolution go one complete rev as I only change a half a turn on my input yoke. So that was one half a turn on my input side and I was able to get one complete revolution from the output. For any of you that are going, yeah, that's still a trick, I'll go to the top view and you'll see this black mark that's on the top right here. That's going to be on my output shaft and you're going to be able to see this yoke go only one half a turn. So I'm going to hold again my helical drive gear, rotate one half a turn, and what we're going to see is that that black mark comes back to the top. So one half turn on the input gave one complete turn on the output. Now that only happened when the output was the only option. Remember that typically driving down the road, if all the wheels are able to drive and we're driving straight ahead, everything will rotate as one. And so then if I do that, you'll see that my helical drive gear and my rear output shaft are all turning at the same RPM. My bevel gear is rotating and we're driving down the road in a straight ahead condition. And so as we come around to one complete revolution of the input yoke, we're going to see we made one complete revolution of my helical drive and my output shaft. It's only when we see a difference in torque that the speed will go to the path of least resistance. So to show that, I'm going to hold this output shaft and simulate good traction in the rear axle and poor traction in the front axle. And so what we're going to see then, if I make a mark on this helical tooth that's red, if I paint one helical tooth red, we're going to see that I will be able to hold this, get one input revolution of my input yoke, or a half a turn, sorry, and we're gonna see one complete revolution of this helical drive gear. And once again, that's because the speed from this rear axle will be moved through the differential case because of the spider gears or the differential pinion gears climbing over the held side gear. So I'm gonna hold the rear side gear and I'm going to rotate my input yoke. So in one half revolution of my input yoke, I was able to get one complete revolution of my front helical drive gear. Now it's really only one helical drive gear in the inner axle differential. And so what we see because of the differential case, the differential spider gears rotating around the stationary axle side gear, which in this case isn't an axle side gear, just the differential side gear driving my rear differential. That differential had traction, I was holding it. My front differential, you'll notice my axle shafts are not even here, and it had very little traction, and so then all the speed was directed there. When we lock the differential, so we move our inner axle into a locked condition, and we lock our input yoke, my helical drive gear, my differential case, and my rear output shaft, when I lock them all together, then no matter what, Whatever resistance I hold here, no matter what, my speed will remain the same. And so I won't see those marks again until I make a complete revolution of the inner axle differential. And so then what we see there is that in locked condition, my front and rear axles must drive at the same speed, but they're going to have possibly varying torques. And the reason why they might have varying torque is because we are not creating, with this lock, we're not creating traction between the tire and the ground. All we're making sure is that they rotate at the same speed and then the torque in the drive shaft will be determined by the path of greatest resistance. Rather than when we're unlocked, our speed can vary between the front and the back, but our torque will be perfectly split between the front and the back. So those are the two modes of our inner axle differential. Once again, just for review, our path of power, let's say to drive the front axle, would be into the yoke input shaft, into the differential cross shaft of the inner axle, through the differential pinion gears of the inner axle diff, through to the 
helical drive gear because of the side gear profile cut into it, down into the helical driven gear that's driving our pinion, that drives the bevel gear, and then from our bevel gear, again, same as we've been talking about the whole time, from our bevel gear into the differential case, from that differential case then into the cross shaft, the cross shaft into the differential pinion gears, from those differential pinion gears into the axle side gear, from that axle side gear out to our axle.